Hello gang, uh, week one, learning module one. We're in the March section of uh, packaging design and we're gonna be exploring uh, two-dimensional designs that wrap into a three-dimensional space. We're gonna kind of spoon feed you early on with uh, some simple, simple templates, kind of simple processes in the die cutting world of packaging design. And then we'll kind of baby step each learning module each week into a more complex uh, solution. I try to provide every single week uh, about a 45 minute demo for each of the projects. So we can kind of explain what the lines are, what the bleed marks are, where the folds are, where there might be glue in the packaging design, uh, all the elements we need to know in order to create successful packaging designs. I love the concept of designing in two-dimensional planes, but wrapping them into three-dimensional spaces. And you obviously know from going to any store, products and services, there's some form of design wrapping that product for sale on what we call point of purchase environments, the POP environments, which is what you see when you go to the store to buy a product. Uh, so designers have to create those things. They have to problem solve. They got to figure out where the die cuts are going to be. They have to problem solve, solve a creative way to wrap a solution around a product, which uh, makes for an interesting challenge. The more creative packaging designs, if you Google creative packaging designs, you're going to get some really cool, really ridiculous packaging designs. Traditionally, you see the more creative packaging solutions in kind of gourmet or niche kind of stores. So if you go to like a Whole Foods or you go to a fresh market, or if you're up north somewhere and you go to like a Wegmans, a little more high end of a shopping experience for a product, uh, you'll see kind of more inventive because they're typically smaller run, smaller produced products where they can really emphasize packaging. And in some instances, it's hand packaging where they're actually making and wrapping and packaging these things one product at a time. When you go to Publix or you go to, you know, one of the bigger kind of mass produce, and I'm using food stores as an example because every aisle you go down, the product is packaged in some way, shape or form, whether it's a container, a jar, a tin, a box, in some way, the product is a baggie, like in the, uh, uh, bakery section, right, is packaged in a baggie, baggie with a label, uh, still packaging design, right? So depending on the experience, the store you're in, you may get more die cut, more complex, what I would consider fancier packaging design. And when you go into places like Targets and Publix and things like that, they tend to lean on the minimalist side, traditional simple packaging design, uh, easier to mass produce, easier to fold and glue, and and package just an easier process. When you see the octagon shaped boxes and all these more comp complex packaging solutions with die windows and all kinds of things where you can reach in and touch the product, that's more complicated. It takes a more, what we call one off process, one off from the template process, makes it you know, a little more challenging for the person creating. But keep in mind, creative packaging can sell the product even when the product isn't good right? It might not be a great product, but the packaging is so cool, someone buys it. And if you can get everyone to buy it just once, your product's actually a success because you've sold millions and millions of units of a product that just was eh, okay. You know, like the as seen on TV products, right? They're pitching them on TV and go and buy it. And sometimes they're in little cool packages. You get them home and they don't actually work the way they say they worked as the as seen on TV product, right? So you're seeing packaging now with eco-friendly packaging where the paper is biodegradable, there's less bags, there's, there's less packages inside of packages. So you don't see baggies inside of boxes. So now the packaging part, the box part, the container part becomes that more important. I've always been enamored, kind of infatuated with the packaging process. I don't know if you saw, I think it's one of the soap companies for cleaning your dishes now has a squeeze bottle without a cap. So it has like this interesting nozzle system where when you turn the bottle upside down and squeeze it kind of like a ketchup bottle, it shoots out the cleaner, but it only sprays out the cleaner so that when you release the bottle, there's no drip. 
So you can literally sit the bottle back on the counter and there's no mess, no drip, no anything. It only shoots when you squeeze it. They created a nozzle system that kind of looks like uh, that sand monster from Star Wars that I think Bobo Fett fell in had the weird teeth all the way around it. That's what it looked like and it squirts out and then closes back up. It's genius. It's a squeeze bottle that works exactly the way it's supposed to. A flat bottom, you can sit on the counter upside down, you pick it up, you squeeze it on the dishes, you scrub the dishes, put the bottle back down. No drip, no mess, no cat, no losing stuff, no breaking something. It's all self-contained. Genius. So I'm really into that kind of stuff, uh, trying to problem solve. I've worked with companies where they actually would let me go look at packaging templates and then tell them which one I think would be the coolest for what they're doing. And then they would buy it. I designed the box and then they would allow me in the creative process to pick the container that the product is in. That's pretty cool. So I could pick the die windows. I could pick the folds, the complex folds, that sort of thing, because they had an automated machine that could fold whatever. So they let me just pick it. And then they built the product box around what I picked, which was pretty cool. So um, I've kind of been involved in the process quite a long time. My days way back in the day with Pepsi, one of my primary responsibilities was point of purchase displays. So if I wasn't doing the containers themselves, I was doing the shelving systems, the rack systems, the graphics that encompassed the products, Pepsi's Lay's, Lipton Tea, that sort of thing. And so I would get the die DWG files, right? You probably know DWG files from your intro to CAD course, right? Those are drawing files. Well, those are the CAD files I got as a designer in EPS or DWG that I brought into Illustrator and I laid all my designs out on. I had to understand bleeds. I had to understand cut lines, die cuts, all that sort of thing. So that when they produced the product, it came out exactly the way I envisioned it. You don't just design the front, give it to someone, design the back give it to someone and say, hey, make it look like this. You got to know the template. You got to know where the sides are, how they, how they function. Lots of times in class, I have students just take pieces of paper, print out the template, cut it, fold it, and figure out how it works before they ever try to design it because packaging can be tricky. You think you put it in the right place till you actually produce the thing, cut it, print it, cut it, fold it, glue it. And all of a sudden you're like, this isn't what I wanted at all, right? It's not on the right panel. It's not on the right side. Well, I thought that was the front cover. It was actually the back cover. So I put the design completely backwards, right? So tonight we're going to explore die lines, all the, the ideas behind basic DWG templates, basic drawing templates. I've exported them as illustrator files, or sometimes I'll give you EPS or PDF files that are breakable so you can bring them into a vector program. I create all my packaging designs in vector form. It doesn't matter if I bring a raster graphic in, that's fine. You can embed a, a raster graphic in your template. You just wanna make sure it's high resolution, it's the right color mode and that it's scaled appropriately. You can't stretch it, you can't make it bigger, right? All the things you can't do, we should already know that from Photoshop. You bring it in, you gotta scale it up, it's already a train wreck, right? So you need high resolution, you need it to work in its place but I collage all of my packaging designs in a vector program where I incorporate vector, which means text, right? Illustrations, vector graphics, color. And I import in either layered Photoshop files or transparent graphics, a PNG file if it's high quality. Most times I bring Photoshop files in where the background is transparent and I bring it in as a layered Photoshop file. Because remember, Adobe plays well together in all programs. So Photoshop comes in layered right into Illustrator. And if it's transparent background, it comes in transparent. I can layer it in layers in Illustrator, or I can organize it in sub layers in Illustrator. So I get the finished product. Remembering that the template is both vector and raster, and in tonight, I just grabbed some graphics and we're just gonna collage some things so you can see the process that I go through. But my final output is a press or high fidelity PDF. So if I'm in Illustrator, I have, my first project is the folder project, very simple packaging concept, right? I use my vector graphics. I import in some raster elements. Uh, I saved a PNG off the, uh, the website of the company I'm going to kind of mess around with a template for in the folder just so you can see the process. Um, 
I would have brought that into Photoshop and made it a layered transparent background Photoshop file, 300 DPI to bring it into the folder. We're gonna see the process of collaging. Then when my product was done, 100% of output. So when I open up a DWG file or normally it's an EPS or a DWG file, sometimes they give me PDFs at the print shop. Uh, I'll open it up in Illustrator. I open it up at 100% final output. So if it's you know a, a nine by 12 folder, well, that folder has two sides, right? So now that's double the size. Then I have the tabs that I have to fold in, my glue tabs, right? I'm working in a pretty big document. I'm building in 100% output. So when I save that high fidelity or press quality PDF, it's an immediate match resolution wise, wise to what they're outputting. And remember when we pick colors, if it's a matte finished product, we're putting it on cardboard that we're wrapping a toy in or something. Remember the saturation will be slightly different than a glossy output. I learned that really early on because I was designing for a guy who was making golf bag roller carriers. So you take, you put your bag on the little roller carrier. Well, he invented it here locally. One that was a little different than all the other ones. He reached out to me. I had to design this big packaging design. Well, think about a rolling product, right? This package was three feet long. It was probably two and a half feet wide, each panel of all the sides. And I had to create that. It was like, I think it was about a two gig file when I was done just for the packaging for this wheelie cart. But I had to do it in 100% quality, 100% resolution. I had to bring everything in, high quality, 300 resolution, full size Photoshop files. So when I photographed the cart, I had to cut it out I had to put it on the box. I mean, it was a big file. You don't wanna be working the size of a stamp and expect it to be able to be blown up to a cereal box size when you're done, because unless it's all vector, you're gonna get a resolution issue when you output it. So we're gonna learn a little bit about that as we navigate through packaging design. Keeping in mind that the finished product for this class for each of the projects is to create something that has a professional real world application. So like for project two in learning module one, it's our DVD packaging. I want you to create the cover and embed it in the Photoshop file so it looks like it's in the case. Don't give me the design for the cover as a PDF and it's not actually in the file in the case of the Photoshop file. We want it to look real. We're working on understanding the process of packaging design and what the final output will be. So I wanna make sure that your projects come looking professionally finished, right? Embedded in the templates in a way that we can see it so that we know and we can bring it to life. Okay, so let's get into everyone in the class I've seen the half dozen or whatever I have in packaging this month. I've seen, and you've had, all of you have had me in class before. So you know the process of submission, you know the process of commenting and grading and giving back, you know the process of editing your file if I have some questions and the resubmission process. Most of you are really good with submitting kind of in a timely manner so we can kind of keep the ball rolling so we can keep working on our projects. So let's go into learning module one. Now, for the class, I have PowerPoint presentations and project templates and resources embedded in the learning module. We used to have a packaging design book, and it was a, re it was a good book. It had um, case studies and basic packaging processes, but I quickly realized that I could take the content in those chapters and embed them in presentation and resource videos and images, and we wouldn't need the extended resource of the book. So I've gathered all the files from the book. I've embedded them in presentations and videos and resources and templates for our projects. And I've combined them with the lectures for this class so we can learn and keep going. And we're not tied to a packaging book that has good case studies and it did. And I screenshotted some of, some of the pages and put them in the presentation folders and presentation PowerPoints and such. Uh, but it's equally because packaging is evolving so quickly with the eco-friendly process, with the zero emissions movement where everything has to be really green and we're not having a carbon footprint or anything, that packaging is evolving so quickly that if you Google any packaging design, 
2021 to 2022, you're going to get different solutions even from that period of time. So we're going to kind of use the announcement section to share thoughts, concepts, you know, packaging ideas as we tackle each of our projects uh, to keep us as current and up to date as we can with the process that's going on. I always kind of use Apple as an example because they're really a as close to recyclable 100% green as you can possibly be. They're really conscientious of paper choice, of dyes, which inks are biodegradable. They're really good with the process. People say, well, it's very minimalist. Well, it's minimalist for two reasons. One, it's their brand, and two, it's eco-friendly. So that's why their packaging is very thoughtful. It's very well executed. It's very consistent across all of its products but it's also very green. So in the end, you wanna lower the cost of production for your client and you wanna increase the ability to recycle. That's why soda companies and juice makers, and you're seeing how packaging is even evolving there. I just saw that uh, Coors Light, the number one selling beer in the United States doesn't use a plastic ring anymore to ring their six packs. They've gone to a cardboard box that wraps around the six cans that has a tab to hold it because it's now 100% recyclable. So we're getting better as a world at creating thoughtful packaging design for not only the end user, the person you're selling it to, but also for the environment. So it's just something to think about as we're exploring and we're looking at templates and we're building things that packaging is just a much a creative process for selling a product. A cool package will sell a product, but also a thoughtful solution where we're creating things that can be recycled and reused and that sort of thing. So there's millions of articles on them. This is a great class for just beating your brain with what's happening today. That Coors Light article literally happened on Monday of this week that they've removed the plastic rings. If you know anything about plastic rings, soda companies have already done that. They've gone to cartons, to mini packages, right? These little tab systems, like when you buy tea and stuff and flavored waters, it's because the rings are bad for the environment. They take millions of years to biodegrade. They go in the ocean, animals get caught in them. Like it's a bad thing. It's amazing that it took till this week for Coors to announce that they're not doing plastic rings anymore. Because keep in mind, that's part of the assembly line when they can them. The very last thing is six cans get a ring forced over the top and they slide down into a tray and there's a person at the end and they stack them into 24 cans. They slide them over and they stack them on templates and they on on pallets and then they wrap the pallets. I mean, it's part of their process. So to go from those six cans sliding down and getting wrapped around a box now and glued and slid to the end before they get stacked in the 24 packs, it's a, diff, it's a costly new process, but they've come to the realization that the environment and how the customer kind of looks at the product and how environmentally friendly it is matters to the consumer. So now it matters more to the person producing the product. Okay, so that brings us into week one. We have a presentation. We have a, a little reading and resource section. Uh, we have a design sample share. So if you find a cool folder or a cool packaging design that you wanna share in the design sample, remember that's peer to peer, that's kind of consumer to consumer, designer to designer. That's how we share nowadays, share ideas. Often it's a, a, a message board or a chat thing or a Zoom call or something. So share, feed your brain, feed your uh, classmates brain. Make sure you share something as you're kind of researching the process. Uh, as we have too many projects, we have our presentation, we have a basic reading and resources, and we have a design sample. So I'm going to go into the folders because I haven't downloaded the template yet. Here's our template. Uh, we're creating a basic folder project. You can do it for a client of your choice. I'm allowing you to pick something you might be inspired by. Maybe it's a unique product or a unique service or a company you just like. Keep in mind that we're building based on the resources we have available to our fingertips. So we want to make sure that we're picking something that has images, has a logo that we can use. 
in a transparent environment or one that we can live trace or draw all over the top of. <laughs> we need access to resources. I chose a company that's moved their corporate headquarters right here to Fort Myers as a, a company to kind of play around with because A, they're local, B, they got an interesting kind of a, a business model and, uh, and three, they're kind of fun and colorful. So I thought it would be an interesting thing to tackle. So I'm gonna go ahead and download the folder and I'm just clicking on the link. And once it's downloaded, I'm gonna drag it over here to my desktop. And for now, I'm gonna minimize my uh, browser so we can take a look at this template that I have here uh, saved. Now, all I did for you guys was I just downloaded a basic template from Vistaprint. If you've ever used Vistaprint before, millions of clients, I mean, gosh, so many of my clients want to use Vistaprint or one of the really inexpensive mass production kind of environments for uh, producing folders and business cards and magnets and keychains and mugs and you name it. If it's what you call swag for a product or a service, they want to use a mass produced environment like a Vistaprint. There's lots of them out there uh, that do the exact same thing. They produce swag in a mass produced environment, uh, but Vistaprint's a pretty decent one. So I downloaded the template just so that you could see. I'm actually going to go in now and you're going to see all these guides that I've snapped for you. So you can see bleed lines, you can see crop lines, you can see cut lines. The interior line is your safety line. The next line would be what would be considered your cut line. And the third line would be your bleed line. If I was giving you kind of the representation of these guys, but I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna go into <coughs> my guides and I'm just gonna hide them for a minute. So you can see what is going on in this template. Now, when you see these blue lines, those are what are called our safe lines or safe margins inside of our design. Anything from a text or image standpoint in this template that we don't want folded, cut, or creased have to exist inside of these blue lines. The blue lines are our safe lines. I'm gonna scroll down here because these red lines are our cut lines or trim lines or what we call our die lines. Red lines are always die lines. So if there's a little red line in the middle of this design, let's say it's a square or a circle, that means a window is cut out of the template, which means you can't put anything in there that you want people to see because it's gonna be punched out when it's die or trim cut. Blue lines are safe lines, which means text and images that we don't want folded or cut have to be inside the blue areas, inside those windows. Anything outside of the red line is going to get cut, trimmed. But that also means that if we want color to go to the edge of any of those red lines, the color has to go one eighth inch outside of that red line. 0.125, right? So if you want something to bleed off, if I end the color right at that red line, there's a good chance if I'm printing a hundred of these and they're being cut in one time, remember a hundred of them in a hundred pound cover stock, it's going to bow when the pressure of the blade comes down to cut the box. If it bows, it means the boxes at the bottom of the 100 count stack are gonna be trimmed outside of that red line slightly, which means there'll be a white edge. You can go to the food store and check any packaging and there's gonna be some packaging you see more than likely that have white on the outside of that bleed color. That means they didn't bleed it at least 0.125 inches off the edge so that when it folds and normally it prints more than 100 at a time. I'm just using it as an easy number. That blade's heavy, it's big, and that paper bows depending on how heavy the weight is. And the folder is gonna be at least 100 pound cover stock is what they call it, thicker paper. So when it bows, you wanna make sure there's bleed color because it's going to bow when you cut it. And that's the number one thing that always happens. What's the easy safe card? take the apple route, the box is white and everything floats in the safety line area and they never have anything on the edge of the design. 
makes it really, they don't even have anything in the fold, which is right here. They don't ever overlap a product or a watermark or an apple symbol or anything in the fold area. Everything's on the back or on the front or in the safety area. Well, I love bleeds. I love putting an image across multiple surface areas. I love making it look more complicated than it is. So I love the challenge of putting things kind of like if you ever had the environmental design class and I was like, well, why'd you put the logo where the door opens, right? You gotta know the seams on the vehicle, the door openings, the sliding door, the bus when the doors open, the steps come out or whatever. You have to know that because you can't put elements. I can't put a word right here really small because it's gonna go across the fold and no one's gonna be able to read it. Can I make the word really big so it becomes more of a graphic, a watermark than an element that needs to be read? Absolutely. But just be aware that they're only gonna see the front of it when it's folded. So. I don't know if you've ever seen design fails before, but if you ever Google it, packaging design fails, you're gonna get people that put images over folds. And when the thing is actually folded and made as a finished product, you get things that you might not want to get <laughs> in the packaging design. Sometimes obscene, sometimes just awkward and weird because they didn't truly understand the green fold area. So you can clear the guides, you can hide the guides. I just put them there to show you the safety line, the fold line and the die cut line. So I pre-snap them all there for you, but I turn them off because I already know what the template is and it's right here. And I already know what is the back panel and the front panel. I just left the DWG template exactly the way it was so that you had an interaction with the elements so you knew what they were. You should notice the gray is the glue area. Should I put anything in the glue area? You shouldn't even put color in the glue area because it's a waste of ink and it's gonna be glued. If you have a bleed, you do need to bring the bleed into the glue area because if I stopped it right at the edge of that glue, there's no guarantee that the machine is gonna glue it perfectly in that little gray space. So just know that, right? There's some, a 0.125, about an eighth, a 16th of an inch to an eighth of an inch error window that you need to know in packaging design because they're not packaging one at a time. But in my intro, I said, when you go to really gourmet niche stores and you get really complex product packaging, that may be people literally packaging those products one at a time. If you go on to new products, ones that are trying to be sold on Etsy and some of these uh, storefronts that people are making products, they are literally hand packaging each one of their products. So they can do some really complex packaging because they're sending it to a printer to be die cut like this is, but they're gluing it and building it themselves one at a time. All right, so now that we see how this thing is set up, I'm gonna go over to my layers environment and I'm going to unlock my layers. The reason I'm gonna unlock my template and keep in mind that this layer right here, we could call drawing layer if we want, because that's where we're gonna bring our elements in and our template layer, we're going to lock once we understand and get rid of the things we don't need so that we can start building our template. I actually like to put my drawing template under my layer template so I can see all of my lines when I'm creating my elements so that I don't get confused in that environment. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna delete all of my elements from my template that are just my directions. Don't hide them. I go in and delete them all because I already know what the lines mean, what the text areas are, all the things I need. So I'm gonna get rid of anything I don't need. So this is what my template looks like when I'm ready to design. I already know the safety lines. I already know the fold lines. I already know the die cut lines. And you'll notice these four little dashed lines are cut lines. 
that's where the business card goes in the folder, right? And these two tabs get folded forward and they're glued in the inside of the folder when we fold these two tabs, right? We fold these two tabs on the end in, they have little curved die cuts. They fold in, this folds up. This tab is on the outside of this panel and the glue is only glued down in this bottom area of this tab when it folds in. So the only thing holding this thing together are these two areas of glue. The entire package is held by two areas of glue. Pretty impressive when you see an actual finished folder that people stick all kinds of documents in that it looks like this as a flat object. This is the cover of your folder. This is the back of your folder. This is the business card fold, 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 fold. And this is traditionally where the branding of the company is for the interior of the folder. Because remember, when you open the folder, you don't see the outside, right? You open it up flat. Well, you want to make sure at any point in time that the thing is folded or opened, that there is branding located somewhere, which means when this thing is folded, the front cover has branding. When you flip the folder to the back side, but it's still closed, there should be branding on the back side too. When you open the folder up, there should be branding somewhere in here on the tabs to reinforce brand, brand, brand. Traditionally, folders have full bleeds on the outside and the interior is white and the only color exists in these tab areas. Traditionally, it's a one-sided print job, which we call one-sided or one-up print job. There's only color on this side, the other side is white, which makes you think if you pick a black box paper and you print your design on that black paper, that the interior of the folder would be black, right? Or gray or blue or green. Why do most people use a white cardboard stock for their folder? Is because they want the saturation of their colors to be really impressive. So they want white because white allows for the most color saturation when they do their designs. But I've seen some really nice black folders where the logos are actual foil or metallic ink and they put them here and they print them on black paper and the logos are foiled on there and they're embossed on there to make them look really good. When I'm designing on a dark or different color background, I use my template and keep it white because I already know what color the paper is going on. Some designers will draw a colored background to match the color of the paper and then they hide it before they send it to print so they can see what their design looks like as they're designing it before they send it to print. I design on a white or transparent background. If I'm printing on different colors, I just create the thing in an environment where it just prints it onto the colored paper. But some like the visual of having a black background of some kind if they're designing in black and then just hide that shape, hide that sub layer or layer before they send it to print. And then they just pick the stock and say, I want 100 pound stock, black, uh, matte finish and print this template onto that black background. It's whatever functions best for you. Most designers, when they're newer to the process, will make the folder the color they want it before they print to paper. Because remember, if you print to a light blue stock because you want a light blue background, it's less ink to print on blue paper your design than it is to print a blue background onto a white piece of paper, right? It's cheaper, it's better, it's easier. It actually looks cleaner if it's on the paper, but it depends also on the look because if you're going glossy, it looks way better to have color backgrounds printed to white, glossy, heavy stock because the gloss will pump up the saturation of the ink and really give it an impressive look. So a couple of op options based on functionality. For class, we're just learning the template and building in a way that's 
interesting and fun and playful and appropriate based on the size of the packaging, we're not actually producing them. There were times that I actually had students for their final project take their template to Copy Max or to Office Max and print it out and take it home and cut it with scissors and put it together and take it as a photo with their phone and submit it as their final product actually taken in 3D form. I'm still thinking about that for week four, that you actually print this thing for the 25 cents at Copy Max and fold it and glue it and make it and take a picture of it for me so I can see all the sides of it on top of giving me the flattened design. So we'll see as the class evolves. We'll see how you guys do with the panels and the sides and see how it works. So, okay, so that brings us in uh, to template number one. Right, so I hit all that stuff for you guys. I just wanted to explain that stuff. I'm gonna lock it now. I'm actually gonna go in to my document icon and I'm gonna extend out my document a little bit because when you get the DWG file, they actually give you that file right to the edge of the die line. But I wanna expand the template out a little bit so I can see my 1 8th or 1 16th space so now you can truly see that there is a slight angle to that in the tabs when they fold them in. So they're not flush to the top here. You can see all the nuances and I zoom in. You can see it's a beautiful DWG file, like that CAD creator that drew that for the manufacturing company, for the box company. They did a really beautiful job with all the line work. All the designers always ask me, why do we take intro to CAD? Well, there's lots of reasons. A, design isn't just subjective, it's objective too. You're creating things that actually, actually exist. And B, even if you prefer subjective de design than objective design, at some point in time, you're gonna interact with a DWG file, whether it's an environmental installation, a graphic, something for point of purchase, some three-dimensional space, a booth, a box, a package, something is going to come in a DWG file that more than likely, pretty guaranteed, it's gonna come in a, an objective form, which is CAD. So just so that you understand the process. So uh, that's how we make the leap. I'm just good enough in CAD to be dangerous. I've had to interact with enough DWG files, drawing letters for metal shops so that they can create three-dimensional letters and things. I have just enough experience interacting in a manufacturing environment. One of my main clients, very early on, actually when I moved to Southwest Florida, was a fuel injector company out of Naples. They created the fuel injector parts for everything from washing machines to locomotive trains. If it had a fuel injecting part, this company made it. And they actually were just bought by CAT Manufacturing, the big construction manufacturing company, because they wanted all the patents for all the injector parts that this company that started in Naples, Florida had created the patents for. I did all their packaging design. So if the fuel injector part came in a package, I made the package for them. The boxes, the die cuts, everything. So that was a fun project. So I know a thing or two about CAD just because I needed to, even though I was a traditional graphic designer. Okay, so now we're in the environment. So now we know the right side is the cover. The back side is the back cover. So everyone knows that we need to brand the front cover, right? If you fold the folder and you lay it down with a stack of them on a table, you have to be able to see the brand in order to interact with the brand. So uh, I'm gonna go in here and the company that I grabbed a quick logo from is Neogenomics. I don't know if you heard of Neogenomics, but they just moved their global headquarters and I mean, global headquarters to South Fort Myers, and they are cancer research. They do all the research for curing types of cancer. They actually have a beautiful building on I-75 when you're driving south at night, they change the color of the lights around the building. It's really spectacular. Uh, I thought it would be interesting just to tinker around with medical design because that's what they are. And they actually have some really thoughtful design, even though it's medical. Uh, so I went in and grabbed a high resolution version of their logo and I just live traced it so that I had a vector version of it. Uh, so I'm gonna copy that. And 
I'm going to close the AI file and I'm just going to bring it in here. Now, remember, I'm bringing it into my drawing layer. And why is that important? If I move it over here and I zoom in, you can see the lines on top of my art, right? This is my vector graphic. I can make it as big as I want or as small as I want. It's a vector graphic. So if you're using a company and you find a PNG file or a really high resolution file out when you do your Google search, just do file place in Illustrator and then live trace it in the properties menu, right? Right down the bottom here, you'll see right where these buttons are, it'll say image trace and you click on image trace. And if it's a logo, you can pick three color or four color and it will live trace it. Just remember to use your direct select arrow and select the white box around it and delete it so it's transparent, right? So if you're using one, just make sure there isn't anything inside of it that's transparent. And look what I just did. I clicked on that and selected it. There's a white version of the logo behind the colored version. I use my direct select arrow and I just double checked. Let's make sure there aren't any things inside of here. If I click inside the O and I drag, there's a white version of that logo that was behind it because I live traced it. I'm gonna delete that just so that I know this thing is completely transparent. So there's my logo. So I'm gonna start with that and know that I need the logo at least in three places. I need it on the cover. I need it on the back, right? I need it on the back because when the rock, when the folder's closed and it's flipped over, you still wanna make sure there's branding there, right? So I need it there, I need it there. And I also need it somewhere in the interior flap. Now, remember that it needs to be rotated on the interior flap because it folds up, right? It folds up to be glued. So you gotta rotate that thing upside down so that when you flip this thing, when you turn your head like this, it's reading the right direction, right? But you wanna make sure there's branding on the cover, the back and the interior somewhere. Sometimes students will put it in here, which is fine inside those die lines. The only problem is when someone puts a business card in there, the business card covers what's inside of that die. And so, Unless the logo is really big on the business card, people don't know it when they open the folder, what's in it. And sometimes companies give out folders and they give them out without business cards attached. I know, oh my God, I can't believe they do that. But they do do that. They give the folder out and there isn't a business card inside. So I always like to make sure there is a logo. Now, obviously, I'm not going to make all three logos the exact same size. The logo on the back should be much smaller than the logo on the front. I'm actually gonna use the logo on the back and I'm gonna put their address and contact information on the back cover. So the front is more branding, the back is more contact. The reason I don't put the contact information on the inside is I'm hoping that they put a business card in there that has at least the address and the phone number if they're giving out packets of information, right? Because that's what they're using this for. They're using it for packets of information. So the first thing I'm going to do is start problem solving. So I actually went in and I just opened Neogenomics website. And this is it. And it's actually pretty nice. And the reason I did that is because I wanted to be inspired on the type of things they use on their website. And you're going to notice their website is a dark shade of the blue. And they made the blue white so they could make everything dark blue on their website. So really quickly for me, I'm like, hmm, maybe my folder should be dark blue because they're very dark blue on their website. So if I scroll down, this looks like uh, Tahoma maybe as a typeface, a very round O, a very sharp V. So I'm gonna explore a sans serif typeface when I do their folder design because that's what I'm using for inspiration. And they also have really beautiful, look when I grab her and I drag, that's a transparent image of her and it's huge. So it's really great for potentially my folder design. So while I'm gathering elements, I think I'm gonna actually drag and drop her on the desktop because you see it's a PNG file and it's transparent. It's gonna be really good. The reason I did 
this also is look at these three shapes. These are the three shapes they use for branding purposes. This little thing, this little thing, and this little thing. So I'm trying to get inspiration for my folder design by looking at what they have and look at the oranges and reds and they have purples and they have blues. I mean, they have really spectacular color. They have another really beautiful image here. So I have images that I can use for my template design. And they also have their address down here. So you can see their address is right here for the corporate headquarters. So while I'm problem solving, a couple of things I'm doing, I'm grabbing inspiration, I'm grabbing elements, and I'm grabbing the one thing I know I'm gonna need, which is their address. So I'm actually gonna copy that while I'm gathering my elements, and I'm gonna go back in here, and I'm just gonna drop it in, just so I have it. Here it is right here. And I'm gonna make it bigger for now, just so that I know where it is and I can see it. It's probably not gonna be that big in my finished design, but I'm gonna move it over there so I have it, right? I'm going to drag and drop my elements that I got from the website. I'm just dropping them in there. I'm actually gonna highlight them and go into my properties window and I'm gonna embed them. That way I don't need the images from the desktop. They're actually embedded in my Illustrator file. So once I embed those, I can actually trash those because they're embedded in my Illustrator file. I used to worry about file size, but I don't worry anymore about that because we have really big terabyte hard drives and things like that nowadays. So I got rid of that. I can actually trash my Illustrator file too because I already put the logo inside my template. So now it's part of what I need. There's my folder. Before I go any further, I'm gonna do a save as, and I'm gonna do Neo folder. 2022. I just like to name them the year, the client, and the output or the product. So I know what it is. So it's Neogenomics. It's their folder and I created it in 2022. So now if you notice, it's right up at the top there. So now I can trash my original template. That way I don't get confused. I know exactly what I have. And I'm actually going to go one step further. Now that I have my basic shapes, I'm going to import in the ladies. The husband and wife there, I'm going to, or couple or whoever they are, and I'm going to embed that. And then I'm going to take my other image I grabbed and I'm going to embed that. So now I have the elements I need and they're all embedded in my Illustrator file. So I don't have to worry about those at a later date. So let's go ahead and trash, make sure I got rid of everything I need. It's all embedded now, so I should be good there. Oh, there's my other one. So let's just trash that one. So now all I have is my Illustrator file, right? I have all the elements I've grabbed so far and I have them in my Illustrator file. I'm gonna save my Illustrator file. So I got the beginning of what I need all set up here. I think I'm gonna take it one step further and I'm gonna print the screen. So if you're on a Mac, it's uh, shift command and the number four and I'm gonna print the screen. I'm gonna draw a little screenshot of the dark blue that's on their website. The reason I screenshot that was because I wanna be able to sample that color in order to make the background of my poster that color. So let's, uh, let's take that now and let me just see, I think I put it on the desktop, but let me just make sure, there it is, yeah. So there it is, I'm just gonna drop it in. So there's my little swatch. And you're noticing that I'm just collecting elements, right? I'm collecting the assets I need for my template because now I kind of know what the sides and everything of my template are. So I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in now. And I'm gonna tuck away my palettes and I'm gonna stretch this back out so I can really maximize my template and where it is. And I'm going to go into view and I'm going to do a fit artboard in window just so it's a perfect fit so I can see all of my sides because I think I've already decided that I want to 
make my folder dark blue. I'm thinking, I'm gonna try it and see how I like it. And then I'll kind of play it by ear after that. But uh, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna move the color swatch over. And I'm gonna take a big rectangle and just, I'm just gonna draw it over the entire thing here. Right, it's a full bleed. And I'm gonna make it the dark blue of the website so that I have the basic blue of the website. And I'm gonna take that one step further and I'm gonna take that blue swatch and I'm gonna drop it into my library as my dark blue color. So here is the dark blue of my swatch library. Now, if I was working for Neogenomics, they would probably already tell me the Pantone color that is that dark blue. And they'll also tell me like, are we going with a coded output or uncoded? Matte finish is called uncoded and coded is the shiny material you see things printed on. And I'm gonna guess Neogenomics is probably coded, although they seem modern and edgy enough that they could be a matte finish company. Uh, but just for the sake of the process, I'm gonna guess that they're probably uh, coded. Uh, so I'm gonna go into coded and these are all the Pantone colors, right? These are all the Pantone colors. And I, if you've had me in a class before, I've explained the Pantone colors as like uh, Sherwin-Williams paint swatches when you go to Lowe's or Home Depot to paint a wall. wall. They're pre-mixed CMYK colors that they drip into a white can and they shake it up and they give it to you. And it's exactly the same no matter which Lowe's or Home Depot you go to to buy the color to paint. Well, this is no different in the Pantone colors are just pre-mixed CMYK colors that are exactly the same if you made a cookie jar in China or you made a folder printed in California. Pantone colors are really important because that makes sure the color that you pick is printed exactly the same way every single time. So I'm just gonna, let's see here, let's mouse over that. And that's a little on the purple side. And watch as I scroll down. Blues get more on the teal and green side as I go from one shade to another. So I'm guessing that blue is somewhere close to 101, I would guess. So if I was selecting this and picking that color, so look, that is really a lot brighter than the blue of their site. So if they didn't give me their Pantone color, I actually wouldn't use a Pantone color. I would use a CMYK mixture, just like I did by bringing in a sample of the blue they used on their website. So I could make a CMYK equivalent, which we call four color process. So you can see it right there as a four color process sampled from their site. If you're designing from scratch, you can pick a Pantone color, just be consistent with the Pantone color as you use it across applications in your design. All right, so I have my Pantone color, so that's good. I can get rid of my swatch now. So once I have my Pantone color, the very first thing I like to do is place branding. So I gotta find my logos again, right? So I gotta click on this and send it to back because my logos are on there. I just had to find them because I drew my box over, right? All the printer cares about in the end is this. They don't care about that template layer, right? They're actually gonna hide that template layer in their process because they're die cutting it and folding it. Right, they're not printing that template inside their output process. So they don't care, but for us, we need to make sure that we have it set up. So now you'll notice on the website, something we have to do in this particular design is I have to change everything that's blue to white because in their website, they used a dark blue background and they made everything white that was blue inside their logo. So I'm just gonna go in now 
and I'm going to change up my blue elements and I'm going to make them all white, right? Just so that we're consistent branding wise, right? We're consistent with the brand. I'm using the direct select because my logo is grouped. So I'm just using my direct select and I'm switching everything. If we're printing this on a white piece of material, there's no ink where this is white. That's the paper. There's only ink where the color is. So if we're printing this as a glossy finish on a white piece of paper, the white you see in my design is not going to have ink on it. It's gonna be the white paper. All right, so now let's zoom out just a skosh. I'm gonna go into fit artboard and window again so you can see my design. Now, I've got my logos pretty much placed. The very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out how I can make this design a little more interesting, right? I need to make it a little more interesting because I've got two sides, this thing folds. We got a really interesting symbol that I might be able to separate and make bigger and make as like a watermark or a graphic that maybe we could go across two parts of the panel. And I also have these rather interesting shapes from the website that I could use as patterns or graphics because they actually use them as patterns on their website. So a couple of elements I'm gonna move over just so I can get into my design a little bit. Now, for me, it's important that I make as many things vector as possible. Could I take this and just do a copy and paste and just butt these things up against each other and make a pattern out of them? I could, I could make a pattern out of them by using the images of the shapes, but this is a really simple shape. So I'm gonna take my circle tool and I'm just gonna draw a circle and I'm going to make it a stroke and I'm just gonna make it a dashed line by checking in the stroke properties as a dashed line. So look at it now. I made my own just by making a circle and making it a stroke and making the stroke a dashed line. So I did that just so that I could make this thing instead of having it be. But I also noticed that they did make them blue. So I'm gonna sample that blue and make it a stroke and make it a dashed line. And then I have the beginning of the exact same thing that's on the website. I'm just making it myself. So let's make it a little thicker. Uh, let's make the dash, I don't know, let's try 24 point. Oh, too big. So now I gotta go somewhere in between. So let's go, I don't know, let's try 16. 16 point, right? So now I can get rid of these. Now this is vector, that's really important because I can make it as big and as small as I want and it's still crystal clear, right? So that's really important. So let's scale that down. And now you might notice that this thing is basically, so let's sample it. I'm gonna make it that. So here it is, right? I'm gonna use my direct select. I'm gonna make it a half circle, right? Pretty simple stuff, but I'm just showing you, I just hap happened to pick something that's very graphic. So I just made a copy of it. I'm just gonna rotate it, move it up so it touches, right? I gotta make sure it lines up right. So there it is, and I'm just gonna group it, right? So now I have this one, I have that one, and last but not least, let's use this template as the same template again. I'm gonna drop it in there. I'm gonna hold down shift option just to make it a little bit bigger. 
So there it is, right? Uh, I can get rid of this, which was the image. I'm actually gonna pan across here and zoom in a little bit because this thing is either a pie shape, right? I can make it a pie shape. So let's first sample the color. I want it to be kind of an orangish color. Oh, let me make sure I select it first. So I have my strokes. I'm just gonna sample the orange. I'm not gonna make it a gradient or anything. Oh, see if it'll let me grab that orange. There it is. And I'll switch it back. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my direct select. I'm gonna delete that dot. I'm gonna delete that dot. I'm gonna take my pen tool and click on this dot. I'm gonna hold down shift so it goes straight and go there and go there, right? So I have my first piece. And then drag it and rotate it. And drop it in there. Get rid of that piece. And I have my other shape. Now I just pick something. I like to do graphic elements, vector graphics, so that I can play around with patterns and stuff and make this thing interesting. I try to only leverage photography, especially in a folder environment. If I make a strip of images inside of like one width that go the length of the folder or place an image that has a transparent background so I can kind of let the graphics interact with the photos. I try, or I cut them out in circles and I make little circles around. I try to use shape to kind of make the thing interesting as I'm building my piece. So now I have Neogenomics, here's my logo. I gotta play around with the size. I'm gonna hold down shift, right? I want it to be kind of to the right. I want it to be kind of down in the one third area somewhere over there. And then I think I wanna introduce some of these pattern elements because they really use them on their website. So I'm gonna move each one off the page. So they're over here. And I don't know, each one means something different. So maybe I'll start off the page. Remember, this is a die cut. So let's do this. I'm just gonna make copies of this thing and make a stripe. So all I'm gonna do is make copies of this thing and make a stripe down the folder. And I'm just problem solving while I'm talking through the lecture. The website, this is all a different part of their business model. So I'm just gonna stripe this thing down. And so there it is. And it kind of ends down towards the bottom here. So now I have my first problem to think about, right? It's a half of a circle that gets cut. So it bleeds off the top, which I guess means I either have to take it to the edge of the folder and clip it right here, because that's where it folds. If I don't want it to go to this back pattern here, hmm, I think, why not? Why don't we just take it all the way down? Anyway, it's interesting for the viewer, right? It's interesting for the viewer to take it. Oh, look at how close that comes to the final tab. I think I'm gonna leave it right there. So it kind of ends, but it ends toward a, towards the top there. Cause watch what happens if I do this. Then that it would kind of come to, I don't know, I'll leave it, let's do that, why not? It would be cut and then everyone would know it was purposeful put there. So now we kind of take this and what if I start it off the edge here and I'm doing the exact same thing I did with the first part, but watch what happens when I connect these, right? It starts to make full circles, which is interesting. The website had it. Now watch if I just draw a big selection box, I can actually copy this entire row that I created. It's gonna make my life a lot easier. I create this thing in one big swoop. Oh but it's not touching perfectly. So let's make sure it does. All right, and then I could take this one and I probably have to hold down shift 
and grab at least a couple of these. And you're seeing me problem solve just like I would with a client. I would do the exact same thing with the client. Now notice this is in front of the logo that I placed on the bottom tab. So I need to bring that in front of the pattern. And so I'm gonna just keep going for a minute here until I get to the end. And I'm problem solving with you just like I would for the client. So there are the first two symbols. Now, the thing about this pattern is this is actually the pattern because they didn't close the circles on the website. So I think I'm actually going to space them equally out, but I'm gonna remove every other one. So you get the pattern that was meant on the website. So now you have the clean circles and you have the break of the pattern just so that it mimics the brand of the website. So now I'm just gonna drop the last one in halfway. And I'm doing the exact same thing I would do with the client. So now I'm just gonna hold down shift so I can grab three at a time. And look at this pattern. When you start making a pattern out of it, it becomes this snake effect, which is interesting. And so I'm just trying to make sure that my concept of their brand is replicated. So now I can get rid of this one. It doesn't matter that it's off the page. I'm just doing it as a pattern. So I'm gonna hold down shift and select these two things and I'm gonna make sure I bring them to front, right? So now you can see my folder is starting to interact from top to bottom in the fold. And I think I want to, so I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. I think I want to grab this DNA shape here. So let's zoom in. I'm gonna click on this. I'm gonna hold down shift, click on that. Hold down shift, click on that. Hold down shift, click on that. Copy paste. Now I'm gonna group it. All right, so here's my DNA all by itself. And so now I think I'm gonna hold down shift, make it really big and I'm gonna rotate it. And I'm gonna run this baby. across the folder. So let's zoom out. Let's see how big we can make it. Ooh, I bet I can get something really interesting here. So I'm gonna rotate this thing. And I'm gonna rotate it so I can get it off of the front and off of the back just so that I can make this thing bleed. And then I'm gonna position it in a way, mm, let's try this. Now that I'm problem solving this. Why not just do that? And so I'm gonna make it big enough to go off of both pages. All right, so it's off of everything. And now I'm gonna go into the properties. And I'm gonna make it a watermark. I'm gonna get way down, way down. So around 20% or so. And look at what's happening. So now I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna hold down shift and select my background color. And I'm gonna send those two things to the back. The reason I did that was because now my pattern is on top of my watermark. So my pattern is on top of my watermark. So the two things in the back are the color and the watermark. Now I also noticed I can go even lighter. You don't wanna go any lighter than I would say about seven to 12%.
If you go less than 7%, you may not even see it during the printing process because it's so light of saturation. Like watch what happens when I take this thing all the way down to 7%. I mean, it's starting to get really light and you may lose that. I actually have the printer run me a proof, a test print, so I can see how light the watermark is and I can adjust it before they do the finish run because if it's too light, you might not see it at all. Okay. And so now I have my logo, I have my pattern. I kind of have some interesting things going on here. I actually think I want to replicate the pattern, the watermark. I'm holding down shift and I'm going to put it just where the business card goes. So let's scale it across. And remember, I got to bring it down so it doesn't touch. All right, let's zoom in. I need it to go at least into the glue area, but I don't want it to touch the fold area because I don't want it to be visible on the back of it, right? So it can't come above this fold and it can't go over there because it'll be on the other tab. It's got to live in this space right here. So I'm actually going to hold down shift, make it a little bit bigger. So there it is. So now it fits inside that tab. I could draw the shape into a clipping mask, but I wouldn't want to because the printer needs to cut that so that this color goes all the way to the edge of that tab. So I need it to bleed, right? I need it to go off of the shape. So now I have the fun pattern. Now I know you see the pattern here and you see the watermark here, but remember this is folded. You won't see them together. You will see them independently. You'll only see them on the front wrap and you'll only see it when you open the folder on the back tab. You never see them together, even though it looks redundant or duplicated in the template because the template is flat. Okay, good. Now I need to make the logo smaller on the back because it's just a small watermark. So here it is, right? So there it is centered on the back. So let's take this thing and shift it over just a skosh. I'm actually gonna bring my ruler line and I'm gonna drop it in the middle of that tab. And I'm gonna go back in and I'm gonna turn my guides back on because that line's important because that's the center of the back. So I drop the line for the center of the back. Now, remember your bounding box has these two little center boxes. So just center that so that you have it on the center. All right, so now I'm gonna take this. This is our address. So the back traditionally has the logo and the address on the back so that if someone grabs it, it has it all there. So here is my direction. So I could put it above the logo. I could put it below the logo. That's really choice. I can play with the colors, right? So I could sample it and make the address in green if I wanted to. I could make it in white. I want it to be something that stands out, right? I'm gonna do it in green because it looks kind of fun on the background. And so now I'm just playing with my elements. I'm gonna move this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, put about seven spaces in it. Let's see what the size is. Right now it's 32. You should know from printing world, we can get around with anything from 12 to 18 point. It doesn't need to be huge. So I'll go in the middle. I'll just make it 14 points so that you kind of get the middle. And I'm gonna bring it, I'm gonna snap it to the center. And I'm going to put it right there. So you can see my folder has the logo and the address. Now I quickly realize my address needs to be below my logo. So let's put it below. And then I'm going to just move it down to like the bottom third of the folder. So you can see my back is going to be my water, my logo, and my address. My front is going to be just my logo with my patterns. The back tab, we can go smaller. With that, I'm gonna shrink that down and I'm gonna make sure that it's centered on my business card. I'm just gonna to try to drop it in the center there. So now I have that centered. I'm just using a grid so I make sure everything's appropriately placed. The last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring these two people over. I don't know if I can use them or not, but let's at least explore the possibility 
of using them. So here's the first one. It's this lady. I don't know. Will she work over here? Remember, these are my safety lines, those interior ones. So if I send to back. So the logo's there. If I use her on the back cover, she might be interesting, but I have to move these two things over into this space. Now remember this area right here. So let me zoom out for a minute and let me hide the guides. This is all you're going to see at one time. So let's make it white. That's the back cover. This right here is the back cover. So let me make the strokes thick enough so that you can truly see it. All you're gonna see is what you see inside this box. So we need to make sure what's inside the box. Here's the girl, here's the part of the DNA, here's the contact information. That by itself could be interesting as a back cover. Remember, all you're going to see at one time is the front cover, right? So these things look complex because they're across a fold, but all you're seeing is the little pieces one at a time. So if I have a girl on the back cover, let's at least explore the possibility of this thing. Remember my safety lines maybe on the front cover, I don't know. Let me zoom in a little bit, see how they look. Uh, let's do shift, send them to back. There they are. Well, they're not gonna work in their current state. Will they work as a watermark maybe? I don't know, maybe. If I did that, I would need to make sure that this really makes sense. So I probably would actually make it where that line for the pattern goes right through the middle, right through the middle of the DNA. I try to make it as close as I could probably. So there's my folder design. So that's my elements placed where they all make sense. Nothing here, because that's where the business card goes here. Now, the last thing I might include they have a tagline, which is one lab vital answers is their actual tagline. So I might bring that in. Let's make it 24 point. Let's bring it in down here. And let's make it white. So that's their tagline. So I might put it in below the logo there. The reason I introduced the tagline is because typically in a folder design, it's like that. The logo and the tagline is on the interior flap on the side that doesn't hold the business card. That way, when you open the folder up, you get the naming branding and you get the tagline, the reinforcer of the business. So the reinforcer of the business, which is the tagline, normally is on the front cover and the interior non-business card cover. All right, so I'll save this, not bad, not bad. So now you're seeing the design of the folder, how it works. I did put some really pretty, really nice business card of a, a folder designs that have bleeds and goes across the fold. And so you're seeing this as the spread in these samples just like you're seeing them flat in the template. So see how it goes across, see how things are in the safety area within that one eighth to one sixteenth inside of the template. 
in order to create the design. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and close out of that because we have our folder project well underway now. So I'm gonna trash the things I don't need. So here's my little folder design. Okay, so let's go in and let's spend a few minutes as we take the leap into our second template. And our second template project is simple packaging. So this is actually the template I provided in my first file. The cover, which is right here, and the interior template, which is right here. And this is actually one of the students' designs. They did hairspray and they did their cover like this and they replicated it on the disc here. And actually, if you scroll down, this is a student's as well. This is their cover of their disc package and this is the interior. So we're using my template and my Photoshop files in order to create a show or movie design of your choice. So we're now just pushing this real world application one step further. So I'm gonna download the first file and I'm gonna open it up in Photoshop so we can take a look at the elements. So I'm gonna click on that. And here is the interior. So take a look at this. There is the image we're replacing right there. Look at this. There is the image we're replacing right there. Let's open up the second file. This project is more about just getting comfortable with the real world. Look, there's the cover right there. We're replacing this image, which currently says sample with our cover design. So I thought it would be interesting. My kids are kind of into this new The Batman movie. So The Batman, The Batman 2022. I don't need the logo. I'm just looking for some images. So look at, so let's see here. How big is this image? Seven, just for trial and error, let's take a look at this image in our template. So I'm gonna do Batman image. I'm just gonna save it over the desktop. So let's now go in here, just for the sake of the process, I'm just showing you the process. So let's do file, open, let's find Batman, select all, Copy, edit, copy, paste. So this image isn't big enough because look, I have to blow it up in order to work in my case. So I need to get a bigger, I need a bigger image for my template, but take a look at this. You see, so I'm gonna turn off the layers because you see this main box right here? That's actually the shape of the template. So watch what happens if I select that box and I use, so let's go in here. And I'm going to, you see this box right here? Let's go into the properties of this box. So it has a bevel, it has a stroke, it has an inner shadow, it has a gradient, it has a drop. It has all of these properties inside of this thing. But look at this. The box is right there. So do you see that box? It's right there. It just has no opacity to it, no fill to it. So it's kind of this clear 
container that this object is sitting in. So watch this. I'm going to turn that back to zero. I'm going to go into my sample layer. So here it is right here, right? My sample layer. You see how I used my magic wand and I selected outside of the sample area? And watch if I do inverse. It's only selected the sample area. So watch what happens now. If I select my image and do select inverse and hit delete, my image is right inside that box. Actually, the resolution isn't terrible. I should have gotten something a little bigger, but I can actually overlay. So look at the sample. See, the sample has the background image, the name of the movie, the basic element. So I'm going to recreate that now. And I actually already grabbed the Batman logo. And looky here, it's already a transparent PNG, I think. So let's copy it. So I'm doing a mock-up. of my case using my template that I provided, right? So let's take a look at the directions. We've got to include the cover design, the interior sheet, and the DVD label. So the interior sheet is this right here, right? But the template is already right there for you in order to drop it in. So let's see if I took my Batman image. So let's take this one. Let's open it up again, select all, copy. So let's get into my template and let's paste it. All right, so I got my thing right here. It is now. I have oh, I have to make sure that this image. So let's select the image. I have to make sure that the image is, is at least as big. And just for the sake of the process, I'm manually scaling these, but we should not make them bigger. So let's hit return. You can see. All right, so now we have our Batman. So the first thing I have to do is I'm going to select this, use my magic wand tool, and click outside of it, right? So now I'm going to go back into my Batman, and I'm going to delete the part of Batman that I don't need. And take a look at that. We can literally transpose our design right over top of our Photoshop file. So let's paste it again. Paste it again. I'm going to scroll down to my disk, right? And I'm recreating, so I'm gonna scroll down. Where's my disc? I'm recreating my front cover, 
my interior pamphlet and my disc as a new creation. So I can bounce back and forth real quick. There's my Batman cover. Now, what do I need? I need the Batman logo. Ooh, that's interesting. I don't know if you're gonna be able to read that, but that would be very interesting as a design solution if you could see more of it, I think. How much do you have to see actually in order for you to see, see the holes cut out? Everything is cut out for us. All the die cuts on this design are done. Ooh, I bet I could get away with something like that, all right? I think I could get away with something like that. I also need my Batman. I also need it inside of I also need it over here. So I've got to take my so let's drag that down. I'm going to hide that. I'm going to drag it below my logo. Uh oh, how did Batman get flipped? So I need to put that in here, right? Because even though they show it here and here, they're two separate things. The booklet comes out. So it has to be on both in order. And I like to do. I don't know, sometimes I like to do, um, so let's go in here. I like to give it a little perspective, maybe uh, distort, I can do this. just to give it a little feel inside the cover, give it a little perspective on it. But look, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there for my cover and for my interior disc space. But you'll notice inside my template, There's text right there inside my template. So it's white. So let's make it, so let's figure out where it is in my overlays. Let's make it bigger so I can find it first. So there it is. So let's figure out, let's tuck that. I'm gonna close this for now so I can expand my palettes. So let's find close tab group. Let's find this thing. Those are my overlays. Oh, they're turned on to pass through. So let's turn them on to normal for right now. And I'm going to, you see all the logos, they're all in here. There they are, there's one, there's another, there's widescreen. So we have to adjust all of these things. So you can see them now. So I have to adjust all of these things now. So here's my first block of text. So there it is. So I'm gonna make it back to something more reasonable. Bring it back to the bottom of my disc. 
there it is right there. And we got to change the information to match the movie information. So let's find the next thing. So there's my disc. Oh, so let's find my disc icon. Oh, I actually, there it is right there, this one. So I'm gonna do something just so I can see them. I'm going to do a color overlay and make it white. So there's my first shape right there. And then let's figure out where the next one is. Let's do a color overlay. Oh, there it is, DVD. Oh. Maybe I want to move it down here. I don't know. I can play around with it based on my design now. I'm getting there with my disc. I have my DVD icon. I have my, this is like the, the Dolby symbol for high definition sound over there. We have widescreen, full screen, which is right there. So let's change that color. And so we got to make sure all these parts work. There we go. And I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm getting to the packaging of my template, all my overlays. So I hid my fillers. And I have my case. Now, when you give me your package design, I want this file as a PDF. And I want this file as a PDF of your design. You can hide these if you want to. They're just in there to make the layout look a little cooler so that when you put it in your portfolio, it has a, you know, a cool, but leave these because these are all part of the 3D aspect of the Photoshop file. They're the layered elements. I wanted to make it as easy as possible from a template standpoint to give you the feeling that this thing is a real thing, right? So if you go into the announcements, right, these are the some really beautiful samples, right? The movie, they actually overlaid the disc. It's the same container. They just overlaid it in one. I want them separately. Look at this person. They made it a die that popped out of the disc. One of the students did it as kind of a, this would be a cool label to peel off of the disc, but nice layout, right? Name, basic movie information, movie poster actors coming soon, but really professional packaging mock-up folder a simple baby step the movies a little bit more of a real world application still baby steps because i'm giving you the photoshop template that you're just importing your elements into i even gave you the dvd logo and the movie credits for the disc already you might want to copy them and break them apart and move them around the disc a little bit use your design eye based on the die cut and the folding area of the booklet, because the interior is different than the exterior, right? If you have some DVDs at your house, maybe you do, I don't know, maybe you have Blu-ray or something, open up the packaging, take a look at the cases. If you go to Target or Walmart, just walk down the Blu-ray aisle, there's all kinds of cool discs for inspiration. You're lucky you have Google, so you can just Google it and find some really cool things. You can pick a show or movie of your choice. I want it 2014 or newer because I don't want anything old school. I don't want it black and white or grayscale. I want it to be modern. And also if you pick something new, 2020 or newer, 
more than likely you're going to get 3000 pixel high resolution images in your Google search. Remember, don't scale up, only scale down. And let's see how you do with the two first baby step packaging designs. If you submit them and I give you a little feedback because something isn't working correctly, make the changes and resubmit and you'll get more points. I want you to learn the die cut. I want you to learn the bleed. I want you to learn how these things look. So as we push the envelope of packaging design, we get more comfortable with the final product output. We get more comfortable with the process. So I went about uh, 10 minutes or so longer than I wanted to in the lecture so that I could keep it to an hour and a half, sometimes an hour and 45 minutes, just so it's an easy replay for you. So if you're doing this as a totally online class, make sure that you watch this recording. I'm gonna post it in the announcements in a few minutes uh, so that you can rewatch it as you're designing your pieces, but please do that. I'm gonna turn off the recording now.